Thanks for a uh, very nice presentation before, and both before, I must say. So I, um, I was, uh, so let me relate to this. So this is a, a already mature project, with, but it was ongoing for many years. It's about uh, leniency, asymmetric sanctions, and corruption, and it's about China. Uh, it's a joint work with Maria Perotta Berlin, which is outside with me, and Bei Queen, who was in Stockholm, and now is at Hong Kong uh, University. So the motivation is uh, it starts here when uh, in 2011, Kaushik Basu, who is a friend of us, a game theorist, he used to be the chief economist of the Indian government, and uh, annoyed by being forced to pay small bribes for anything in India, for anything he was actually entitled to, you know, like to go to get a passport, he must pay something. He wrote a small pamphlet that was called, uh, this one here, why for a class of bribes the act of giving a bribe should be treated as legal. So it was a six pages informal piece. It was put on the homepage of the finance ministry where he argued that they should actually legalize paying these uh, bribes for something you are entitled to and double the sanctions for those who take the bribe. And the idea was a classic game theoretic idea is that uh, if you pay a bribe and you're not liable, then you're not afraid to go to the police and report you pay the bribe because you're doing nothing illegal. And then the police is supposed to go to the bureaucrats and you know, put you in jail and you get back your bribe. So the idea was that uh, if the bureaucrats would anticipate that, then they would not take the bribe. Okay? But the newspapers actually harassed him and the government because there wasn't the government was in the middle of a big corruption scandal for helicopter telecommunication and so on. So all the Indian newspapers started saying that he was actually you know, pushing for legalization of corruption, and that's why he was chosen as the chief economist by the government. So actually, I, he ended up with sent away and become the chief economist of the World Bank for three years, you know, uh, uh, probably to save his life from this kind of threats. And, uh, but this you know, sparked a discussion. Okay? And the discussion, okay, the first reaction for the development guys like John Dres was very funny. John Dres is in India and said, look, Kaush, you've been in Cornell too long. You know what happens if a small guy from India goes to the, the police and reports a bureaucrat. It disappears. Because typically the policeman is the same case as the bureaucrats. It's typically their cousins. You know, and if somebody reports a bribe, the, guy, the whistleblower disappears right away and then there is no... So that was Jean Dres take on that. Another reaction was by a legal scholar, a Chinese legal scholar in Chicago. And she wrote a blog post on the Financial Times and she said, well, we did use this policy. We had this policy in China introduced in 1997, but it didn't work. And the reason why it didn't work is because uh, you have a nice idea of a one-shot transaction, but typically these are long, these are repeated transactions. And uh, when the guy reports, a bribe, and then the next month is to go again there, you're going to face the same guy, or maybe a friend of the guy, and you're going to be shut down for any public service forever. So, you know, it, these are small bribes, they will not take the risk, and so on, okay? So that was her point. She's a legal scholar, but there was no evidence about this point, okay? Uh, I went into this debate with Martin Dufer, my colleague, and we wrote a theory paper where we actually took this into the model, this, uh, this kind of debate, and we showed that actually repeated plays were important, and uh, retaliation is very important, so we kind of support a theoretical conclusion in favor of this idea by Lee, but there was no evidence, okay? So there's some experimental evidence by Adbink and others, uh, but in, in the field, but no real data evidence. So that's why we started this project, because we thought this is interesting, and it's also because it's, you know, China is one fourth of the population, and so on. Another reason why uh, this is interesting is that in April 2016, the DOJ in the US introduced a new pilot program in the enforcement of corruption, their Foreign Corruption Practice Act, in which they provide a discount in sanctions for those corporations that self-report having been uh, involved in corrupt crimes, okay? which is a related form of uh, leniency, inducing you know, uh, people to report 
Uh, these are guilty people, they're not reports, and if they self-report, they get a discount. And actually, it turns out that uh, these things was already introduced in Brazil and Mexico in 2014. Okay, this advanced legislation. Uh, in Europe, we're lagging decades behind in terms of you know, sophisticated legislation. Uh, a third reason why this is kind of interesting is that China is, going in the op is now going in the opposite direction than the US and Mexico and Brazil. In the sense that the big uh, crackdown that the new government in China is imposing, uh, well, there's been debate on whether this is biased or unbiased, there's been debate on whether this is actually destroying growth and so on, but the details are not very discussed. What the thing I'm interested in here is the a new law introduced in 2015, where the government increases sanctions for corruption, but it also reduces the ability to provide leniency to people that self-report, and reduce the ability to provide a symmetric sanction, which is what Basu proposed. So Basu was proposing not to give the sanction to bribe payer, and to increase sanction to bribe takers, so that bribe payers would have an interest to report. So these kind of things has been weakened by the new legislation in China because the Communist Party perceived the same as these young legal scholars that had wrote a blog on the Financial Times, that the 97 reform that increased these things was a failure. It didn't help. Okay? So this is what we're, do, what we're trying to understand. So what do we know about these things? Uh, well, we know already a lot. Why? Because these things a very common, have a very common uh, strategic, uh, a very common strategic feature with tax evasion and with uh, collusion, cartels collusion. The prisoner dilemma is a classic example in which you use leniency against one person to let him report another person. And we talk about the prisoner dilemma since 50 years. So, so we know a lot about that in terms of game theory. And we know a lot about that about uh, practice because uh, in antitrust in 93, the DOJ introduced a leniency program, which is an automatic scheme, such that if one cartel member self-reports, he gets full amnesty, and the others get higher fines. Okay? And this has revolutionarized, has revolutionarized antitrust, in the sense these things are spread all over the world, and we have a lot of theory, experiment, evidence on this. Uh, that this works if you do it well, and doesn't work if you do it poorly. So it's a very complicated scheme, if you do it properly, you may have deterrence. Uh, this is what the lab experiments, we, we work with Chloe from this, it shows if you do it properly, it can be very powerful. But if you don't set the detail right, it can be counterproductive. So, and we actually know that, uh, so this is a very interesting empirical problem. Uh, so, uh, what do we do here? So we have a bunch of contribution here. Can you tell me when I have 10 minutes left? Uh, okay. So one of the contributions has been understanding what happened to the Chinese legislation, okay? Understanding how Chinese legislation against corruption evolved from the 80s to 2015 has been a, a very interesting legal inquiry because it's not enough to read the law and translate and read the law. You have to interpret them so we had a lot of interaction with the with legal scholars in China, it was interesting. So we, try, we think we understood now what happened. What we do is we actually apply then on the data, a test, that actually should be able to tell us whether it's true that this was not effective, this policy was introduced in 97, was or was not effective, by looking at data, hard data. And which data is the data on convictions, the only data is which are viable. And the other contribution is we put together a data set, partly of macro data on convictions in corruption in China, and partly from an in-depth microanalysis that we uh, do on, on uh, a bunch of cases on, on China. So there was like, uh, you know, we don't know a lot of China also because of uh, language and things like that, but uh, now we know more, I think. So what are the results? So since I always talk too much, at least I tell you the result first. So. Uh, so we, we think that the, the 97 reform did much more than introduced in the Basu asymmetry. What happened in 97 in China is that they, they do strengthen the asymmetry's punishment, so 
this idea that uh, if you pay a bribe for uh, something you are entitled to, so like an extortion bribe, you are not guilty of anything. So this, this makes it clear. It's made, it was already pre-existing in Chinese law, but the 97 reform introduced this in the civil law, in the, civil, in the criminal um, code, so it makes it much more salient. But it also increases the amount of leniency, in particular for bribe takers. So the amount of discount and sanctions that can be given to a bureaucrat that accepted a bribe. So this is a very crucial thing. So in the same year, we get, yes, what was suggested. We also, also strengthen leniency for a bribe giver, the reports. However, at the same time, they also strengthen the amount of leniency of, of forgiveness that can be given to a bribe taker that is reported. Okay? And this is actually you know, something that can increase the possibility of retaliation. Because if you, treat not, if you reduce the sanction on the bribe taker, this, means this bribe taker will not go to jail. We don't have any administrative sanction. So it will probably stay at this place longer with, with higher probability. So the probability that somebody who reported the bribe taker will find the same guy afterwards may be increasing because of the increased leniency it gets, okay? So you have a mixture of, of that's what. Then we have Prime Minister's test. We'll talk about this, what this is. And we find that there is a significant fall in the number of prosecuted cases after 93, 97, okay? So there is a, a fall in detections or convictions. And this is a per se ambiguous, uh, because in principle, the number of convicted cases can fall because the policy had the deterrence effect. It reduced the number of cases in the population and therefore you catch fewer criminals. Or the number of cases may fall because your tools are less powerful and you detect fewer cases and the population is increasing. <laughs> and so it's very hard to interpret. We know, so this is showing that something happened there, but I cannot tell you for sure if it was good or bad. So then what we do is a case study on, on a bunch of cases before and after to try to get more insight of what really happened and where there was the fall of conviction was due to a successful policy or a failure. And we actually find evidence consistent with the negative interpretations of what Lee suggested. So our evidence seems to be consistent with the fact that this reform in 97 in, Ch in China actually worsened the ability of the state to enforce uh, the law against corruption and the deterrence ability of corruption. And uh, so the takeaway is that, uh, so Lee was right I mean, in her perception, according to our finding, but not because the scheme suggested by Basu was wrong or because leniency is, is, is impractical, but precisely because they did not apply correctly what theory suggests to do. What theory suggests to create a symmetry so you want to give uh, immunity to one guy and double the section to the others. Well, here they gave immunity to the first guy and then immunity to the second guy too. And that's not what you suggest, okay? So this is, now I've given the results. Now I'll tell you how we do it. Uh, so this is about uh, what I said on the legislation. We can skip this. These are the data, aggregate data. Uh, then uh, we also have a lot of data on corruption perception, proxy data to try to understand also whether the climate of enforcement was changing, political things were. And then we did make micro data from the case study that we got only in December. Note, there is a paper on, there is a version of this paper online that says the opposite. <laughs> it's because, you know, we didn't know what we would find in the, in the, in the actually the micro data. And we had to change the interpretation of what we found in the aggregate data once we found the, when we, when we, once we read what we found in microdata, actually changed our, uh, our idea of what happened there. So what is the, the inference problem? Again, the inference problem is when you only have detection data, you see only the number of cases you detect. Then you have a policy, okay? It's introduced a policy in 97, and you see a change in the number of cases. It can be up or down. How do you interpret that? It's very difficult, you know, because you see only convicted data, you don't know the amount of crimes in the population. For this, it's typical for corruption, for collusion, for fraud, and so on. So you, if you see a, a decrease 
of, uh, of in the case detected, it could be because your tools is less powerful, so that you catch fewer guys, or because your tool is so powerful, the fewer guys commit the crime, and therefore you catch less of them. And the problem is how to distinguish these two. So this was a big problem in antitrust, and there is a paper by Nathan Miller with a nice theoretical model that shows that if the policy is successful, then you should accept first an increase in the number of convictions immediately at the policy. So before the population adjusts, you should see a spike. Why? Because the population is the same, but the tools is more successful. So you catch more guys. And after that, then you should observe a fall in conviction later, below the initial level. Why? Because then the, the population adjusts to the new enforcement. The enforcement is stronger. There is more deterrence, fewer cases in the population. So you should observe a spike and then a fall. And he actually applies this to antitrust. This is from his paper. And he actually, this is when the antitrust authority in the US introduced the leniency program. He found a spike and then plateau, OK? There's a lot of debate about whether these data are actually uh, as good as they look like, because there was a, a contemporaneous change that year in the strategies of the OJ. So the, in the antitrust community, there was a big discussion about this paper. But the theory is fine, OK? So we adapt this test to our data. And what do we find? This is the, the data from China. And so you see there's a big fall here. This is when you have the policy, but you don't have a spike. So this was a two-prong test. No? We needed, you know, point one was a spike, and point two was the plateau. We only observed the plateau, which is bad news. Okay. On, so we test this in many ways. This is very significant with the structural test, whatever. Believe me, it's significant. The problem is, what does it mean? It is significant, but what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything because we cannot distinguish these two things, these stories, right? Uh, so, in principle, I would say this is bad news. However, the fact that we don't observe the spike could be due to, collusion, to corruption being different from collusion. So, cartels are typically long term relationships. On average, they last five, six years. Corruption could be an instantaneous deal. You know, you give me the passport, I give you a bribe. It can last one day. If that's the case, then you might have an immediate adjustment. Okay? So if most of the collaboration would be instantaneous, you might think that the adjustment is immediate, and so the test doesn't need a spike. On the other hand, the reform was retroactive. So if you can now report the crime without being jailed, you would expect people just before the reform, committing the crime just before the reform, reporting after, so even if they are instantaneous, you might expect a spike because of retroactivity. So there's a bunch of things that you want to know and we didn't know. Uh, and then there's other issues linked to, to the fact that you might have the fall just generated by the fact that when you have, uh, if, you, if you count cases separately from bribe, bribe givers and bribe takers, the, the fall that we see could be simply due to the fact that after the reform, Bribe givers are not anymore charged if it's in the case of extortionary bribes because they are not illegal anymore. So we just see a fall in number of cases linked to this, but there is no effect on it. So to check all these things, we have a case study with a bunch of cases before and after. And this is the aggregate statistics on the case study. These are the findings. We find that the share of extortionary bribes, like the bus or Russian bribes, and, uh, and, um, and the standard corruption cases, which are more distortive, don't change after the policy. We find that uh, the amount of leniency increases almost exclusively for bribe takers. Now, this is bad news. This is, remember what I said before? We have here, in 1997, what happened is all type of leniency became stronger, so it would be Easy, you know, easier for a bribe payer to report, but leniency for bribe payers was mostly given, and was actually only given, if the bribe payers would report before an investigation is open, while bribe takers 
could be given leniency after an investigation was open. So what's, what happens here, I mean, that what we interpret in the case study, is the more bureaucrats were receiving leniency, so lower sanctions, after being reported or detected. Now, this increases the chance that current bureaucrat stays at his place. Because one of, you know, some of these um, sanctions were you know, uh, sending the bureaucrats to jail. Some are just administrative sanctions. Okay? The more lenient the sanction for bribe taker, the more the current bureaucrat stays at his place, the more it's likely that if you are a bribe giver and you report the bribe taker, they'll face the guy again next week when you need something else. Okay? So this is, speaks badly in that direction. Then we find that sanctions decrease. Okay? So sanctions go down after the reform, in particular for bribe takers, which is not a bad sign. You know? Why? Because you know, what did council propose? Basso suggested to legalize bribe uh, paying and double the sanction for bribe Payers. If you look at my papers on theory papers on leniency, that's what I'm suggesting. You have to maximize the asymmetry of interest between the partners. So you want to maximize, uh, give amnesty to one guy, or even reward one guy, and maximize sanctions against the other. That creates the most opposite of interest in the criminal organization and makes it more difficult to run. While instead, here we're getting lower sanctions for bribe takers while at the same time lowering sanction for, you know, uh, for harassment bribe. Then we find uh, that actually, so we build a measure of the duration of the corrupt relationships, and we find that corrupt relationships are not instantaneous. On average, they last 1.5 years, and you have also very long lasting relationships. So this suggests that we should observe a spike. So the, you remember the test was a first spike linked to the improvement of detection, and then a plateau below when the deterrence effect kicks in. So because corrupt activity seems to be, on average, you know, 1.5 years long, and they can go up to 12 years, we would expect some spike, okay, which we don't observe. And finally, we show that uh, time to discovery, which is a uh, um, the distance between the end when the, when the crime is actually finishing or detected to when it's prosecuted, it goes up, which is consistent with this retroactivity thing of the policy. The people that committed a crime just before the policy was introduced started to report afterwards. And you remember this also would suggest that we should observe a spike if the policy had a positive effect. So all the, and finally, we also find from the case study that there is a big change. There's a significant change in the type of bureaucrats involved. And we show that after the policy, most of the bureaucrats involved are low ranks bureaucrats compared to before, where there was also high ranks, which suggests again into a weakening enforcement. So all the results from the case study are consistently pointing at the week in, in enforcement, okay? So we interpret now the, the fall that we measure, connect, plus all the evidence we have from the case study, suggests that uh, there was a weak in enforcement, no, a bad, bad effect of this policy on the deterrence. So what do we learn from this? That, you know, these things are power, if you do it well, they, being, they can be powerful, if you do it poorly, they can be counterproductive, and that seems to be the case in the 1997 Chinese reform, in the sense that they offered leniency for bribe givers to report, but at the same time they also offered leniency to bribe takers. And the second move, you know, might have, I mean, that our interpretation strengthened retaliation ability of the bureaucracy, the bureaucracy against the possibly whistleblowers, and this hindered actually detection and worsened the environment. Uh, so, but this is not should, should not interpret should not be interpreted as a failure of these tools. This they were not applied as the tools were should apply. There was a failure of the policy, not of the tools. So what Lee said was not correct in terms of the, the debate. It was mixing up a little bit of a, of a, 
And uh, finally, we can, you know, the 2015 reform in China, I think is they're doing very good things. So they're increasing fines and, and sanctions, that's good. We say when we want, and they're also um, reducing this excessive leniency that they introduced in 1997, that's also good. However, they are doing this symmetrically, once again. So they are reducing symmetrically leniency for bribe takers and bribe givers, and that's wrong. The objective of these institutions, that the, actually the, the Latvian government is now discussing in the parliament, is to create asymmetry. So you should maximize leniency for one party and maximize sanctions for the others. While we are continuing to do, sorry, the same things for everybody. But that's the objective of this policy. This policy is designed to create asymmetry. Okay, so that's where we should go. So I'm finished. Thank you. Thank you. We do have time for some questions before lunch. Anybody? Everybody's very hungry. Oh, yeah. Sorry, can you repeat? By having, by Sorry, I was just wondering how much the, why they had the policy in 1997, what the, what the aim of it was, and whether it was to silence people. So we're trying to understand this from, uh, so we analyze data, data from words in newspapers, and we also had the analysis of data in words in the reports of the Communist Party to try to understand and control for the political climate and uh, in the time was not, we didn't see, we didn't don't see anything, okay? So it's very difficult to understand. So we think that uh, ex post, now that I know the result, the result, my, my sensation was that, that this reform was more directed to provide more leniency to the corrupt administrators than to deter corruption. But we couldn't find any sign that it was really the aim of the legislators. So I cannot answer the questions I should ask to the big guys and drafted the, the criminal code in China in 97, but. Okay, there are no questions. Here's a question. I think I missed that. So these uh, sanctions are for uh, bribes that I'm paying for something I'm entitled to, right? So if I'm not entitled. To so there's a mixture of the two. In the data that you have? In the aggregate data, we couldn't distinguish. Okay. That's why we have the case study. Okay. In the case study, we can distinguish, and we see there is no change in the fraction of the two cases okay. after the policy. And uh, the increase in leniency for bribe takers was both for harassment bribes and distortion and bribe. So what we actually conclude, uh, there was a, probably a bad effect on enforcement, and probably it was shared by both kinds of corruption. Yes. Um, a possible logical interpretation of the way the, um, <clears throat> the policy was implemented was that it was an announcement. That is to say, you want to announce that you're doing something and then in fact, you don't do anything. So then, I mean, the government is clean on both sides. I mean, it would be difficult to, to test for that, but for instance, environmental policy, and that is usually done by looking at regulations that are heavily announced, that then if you um, see the wording of the regulation, they are excessively complex. So say, for instance, there, is a, there are some papers that Sounds look very at, Italian. Uh, it's not only <laughs> Italian, I would say. I mean, there is European at best. Okay, uh, yeah. but Italy is there. Uh, and therefore, I mean, you see what is the jump in complexity of the new regulation with respect to the existing one. So that could be... A so, no, no, this is, cannot be a problem because the regulation was already there in a document in 1988, but it was a document with lower legal uh, importance. What happened is actually that they translated this regulation into the criminal <coughs> law. So actually, the wording didn't change. So it was a simple change that increases the status of some rules that were pretty, compared to Italian standards, they're very well written and, uh, and very clear. Uh, but it was a bunch of rules. And the, well, well, we, I think the interpretation of this, my view, is that uh, 
Lee was only looking at, you know, we were thinking about what Bass was proposing, but what happened in 97 was a bunch of three things that interacted strategically with each other in a complex way and destroyed the effect of ones. But I don't, I don't think that anticipation, I mean, we tried to control for anticipation with the wording of the newspapers, and we found only everything was flat. And uh, I think it was pretty clear, I mean, the, once we understood that we translated, we talked to the lawyers, then it was clear to us at least that, that the change was not difficult to understand. But politically, you might be right. It may be that actually they were, they were actually smart enough to forecast that this system of leniency was actually good to improve, to, to facilitate corruption and business and growth rather than hinder it. I, I cannot say how much knowledge there was before.